everybody, welcome back to another episode of Japan by River Cruise. I'm Bobby Judo, I'm back in Fukuoka. Hello everybody, it's so good to have you here listening to Japan by River Cruise. My name's Ollie Horn, and I'm calling in this week from Singapore. The tour continues. Nice. On today's show, over 130 people die from opioid overdoses in the US per day. And in Japan, an actress did some ecstasy. Guess which of those things is the focus of a week-long 24-hour news cycle? And as always, Ali has your River Cruise recommendation. Yes, this week's recommendation is a river cruise in Saga Prefecture, which has been put on especially to host the Saga Prefectural Imari High School's inaugural English speech contest. Listeners of this podcast who are excited to find out what first grade student Emiko Nakamura, who lives near Kanashi Hara Station with her brother, who is eight years old, and her sister, who is 12 years old, really thinks about her dog, should not miss this cruise. The press release we've received suggests her sentiments are positive. Plus, a cruise that only travels 10 kilometers but takes three months? A Hokkaido startup river cruise company finds out the hard way why you shouldn't set sail on rivers that freeze. But first, so <laughs> Bobby, how's your week been? Uh, ups and downs, I guess. Uh, okay, let's focus on the ups. Comedy's been good. I, I Last time we talked, I was getting ready to do... Uh, 20 at the base in Yokosuka uh, went very, very well. And then... Uh, was that I've your got... first military gig? That was my first military gig. And it was not exactly what I expected. Um, I was told to just write a bunch of raunchy jokes because the sailors would love it. And I expected like 19, 20-year-old 19, 20-year-old sailors. And I went and it was actually mostly like military couples in their mid to late 30s. Like, like career military people. Uh, but right. they were still just totally on board for all the raunchy jokes, so it was okay. Oh, great! Yeah, I've I've quite enjoyed. I, I, I've not done any military gigs on bases, but I've done them just outside of bases. Uh, I've always found them to be really fun. I mean, generally, I, th I think they're just up for a laugh. Yeah, yeah. I think they they enjoyed it a lot. Uh, they were really friendly. It was funny because the guy who hosted it, um, he kept like before he brought out every comic, he would ask for a round of applause and then would like discipline the crowd for not like applauding enough and be like i know you know we've been through this i'm gonna make you do this every time i'm not gonna bring them out until you give them a bigger round of applause but he did it in this like very military disciplinary kind of way and you can see on the side of the stage the comedian is like trying to figure out the timing <laughs> like they start yeah, to yeah, come yeah, out yeah. and then they stop and so everybody did that and I, I made a joke out of it when i first went out i was like that's always great to come out to a crowd that's just blend just been firmly disciplined that's um, funny yeah but it was fun he's he's a great host he's a really funny guy it's a good show um, right but so so i did the japanese show the night before that and it was all practice for uh tomorrow night when i have to do 20 minutes of japanese stand-up comedy for a company party and i know i've told you this but like i MC these parties and i watch Japanese comedians go up to do like their 20 minute set at these parties and die because yeah. nobody at these parties like is there because they want to be. So and I th I think you're the reason that corporates pay so well is because you you're kind of just you're kind of being paid to die. Right? Like, yeah, yeah. It, it is it is a really hard gig, and I, this is something which I was discussing with a friend uh, just a couple of days ago that I I genuinely think audiences completely underappreciate the mechanics that go into making a stand-up comedy room work for stand-up comedy like yeah. I, there was um, the, the gig I did in in Miri a couple of weeks ago there was a, a lady who was very very stubbornly sitting at a table on the back on her own and no matter what the other acts or the promoters did to persuade her that that doesn't work right like, like, like there's there's a reason why we have audience members sitting together there's a reason why the audience members sit close to the front there's a reason because the mechanics of the room are if there are people sat in lots of different places if there are people distracted and of course what happens is you have one one or two people sat at the back they start talking because they don't feel as connected to the show right yeah. they might f they're, they're more likely to stand up and leave and so it's really hard to to, to to explain and i think it's only possible to explain this if you've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stand-up comedy shows and yeah, most it's audience not something members that haven't. you pick up like by being in a stand-up comedy audience it's not something right. that you really appreciate so what right. i'm going to do is i like i'm going in with the mentality that i'm getting paid a lot of money to die because it's a great it's a great are you 
Are you going in with that mentality and actually being paid a lot of money, or are you just uh, mind over matter pretending that you're being (laughs) paid a lot of money? So can I pretend that this is a phone call between you and me and not a podcast and say something that will make you hate me? Yeah. I'm getting paid $1,000 for 20 minutes. Oh, man. (laughs) That is a lot of money. (laughs) Do you mount? I think I was once offered five man for this kind of thing, and you advised I turned it down, and I think that was the right decision. I vaguely remember that. Why did I advise that you turn it down? Because you said because you said it would be really really hard, and you said uh, okay, if I do yeah. it if I yeah. do it and do badly, uh, then you might not get future work with. <laughs> so I think yeah, you about yourself. I do remember that, and yeah, and honestly, like if if somebody wanted to pay that much money for 20 minutes in English, I feel like I might feel so much pressure that I would want to like maybe refer a more experienced comedian. But yeah, the I'll very opposite is man. true. The, the very opposite is true for Japanese comedy. Like if somebody was like, we want somebody that you know who does Japanese stand-up comedy and this is how important the gig is or how much we want to pay, I can only think of like two people that I would feel comfortable referring that to you. And in Am I one of those two people? Japanese ability terms, you're not on the list. <laughs> Thanks, man. Man, I'd, I'd smash it. I'd smash it for 20 minutes. In Japanese? Now, do you know what? I would hold their attention and uh, I wouldn't look like a, an amateur, um, but I wouldn't do well. No, you'd I'm look sure like a that. performer, but but like you know how it is, man. Like if your pronunciation is not perfect, anything that lets the Japanese audience take a step back from the joke damages the show. Yeah, and that's true. There's so much in trying to do it like bilingually that I, I hit points in my shows when like I flub something or I, I kamu, I like. I misspeak or I mispronounce something. And the second you do any minor mistake, you've lost that joke. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and, and also the, I mean, just, it's just so hard to explain, but the way that Japanese audiences appreciate comedy is not like a stand-up audience. That is to say, they are generally spoon-fed a punchline. And I, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way. I mean, I mean just the Japanese style of comedy, the predominant style manzai, doesn't have punchlines that need unboxing. Doesn't I, have I visual imagery. It doesn't yeah. have visual imagery that, that needs creating by an audience. And it and doesn't so, require any leap of creativity or critical thinking on the part of the audience. It's it's right. usually signposted with something where someone says something funny and someone else goes, "That was the punchline." In in a variety of ways that mark the punchline that lets the audience go okay it's it's okay to laugh now, and that's why corporates in the in in the rest of the world or in the English speaking world are hard because the audience is less involved right they haven't just spent money to go to a comedy club they're there because their work's paid for a dinner, right and they they yeah. might be in the middle of a conversation they'd rather be having and so the, generally the audience is less invested in doing some of that intellectual heavy lifting and yeah. so that's why in corporates you do have to to maybe well the the tricks are you talk about the people in the room right so you find out loads about the company and then that right. kind of gets their attention uh plus you, you you do material that has kind of very very clear payoffs right that isn't too delicate that isn't too abstract because yeah. also you're appealing to a broad church of people that aren't necessarily comedy fans at least right. people that go to a comedy club are self-selecting so i've got i've got uh my broadest appealing jokes with the easiest to understand payoffs and then i've also done no research on this company like i don't i i did a google search for the name of the organization that's hosting the party and i couldn't find anything that made sense to me it's called I, i'm not gonna say the name of the client but um but i, I couldn't really <laughs> I, I i almost forgot this is a podcast but anyway so i'm gonna go in and assume that i'm gonna get paid to grind through it and do material that i know is funny and that way the people that are listening will enjoy it and I'm also going to try to encourage them for people who want to experience Western style stand up to come close to the stage because you know how these like Japanese company parties are oh, set up. Me, there'll yeah. be a stage and then there'll be a very, very huge like hotel banquet hall style spread out six people at a table here and then a bunch of space between them and six people at another table here. I, I was having a, a, a discussion with a, a couple of comics who uh, I did a show with last week about the hackiest things that an MC can do. And by hacky, I, I kind of mean, you know, the, the thing that 
any MC, no matter where they do it in the world, kind of knows that it's going to work. And because it's old hat, um, sometimes it's not respected. I, right. I kind of have the, I kind of have the view that if your job is if your job is to be the MC, you can kind of do what you need to do to to get the room ready for the comics. And we oh, I think I've just lost you. Uh no, I'm here. Okay. Um, I kind of think you know you, you do what you need to do to get the room ready for the comics, and we discussed this trick where you ask the audience to reach their hands above their head and then to slowly lower their hands onto the laps of the people next to them. And that just, without question, just can't not work to get a room kind of present and energized and laughing and, and giggling yeah. and, and joking. And yeah. um, th- that it's that kind of trick, I think if an MC were to use it in a room that doesn't need it, would, there'd be murmurs by the other comics going, ah, he just doesn't need to do this. But I um, And I'd never done it myself, and I tried it at a show at the weekend, and it, it feels like a superpower. You know, <laughs> you know like it just yeah, it just yeah. works. Everyone's laughing as their hands are in the air. Um, the fact that they're having to, you know, the fact that I even suggest they should touch the knee of the person next to them kind of makes uh, makes the show kind of seem a bit naughty and a bit oh, you know, what's going. And how um, do you think that would go down at a Japanese corporate gig? Well, I think they'd laugh. Actually, I, I do. I think I think they they'd think this is so absolutely absurd. They wouldn't. They obviously wouldn't touch each other's legs. Yeah. Um, but I, I think they'd find the idea absurd. I think I would probably back myself to read a room and to give that a go, and I would, and I would expect yeah. it would get it would get the result I wanted, which is the audience to kind of feel a bit shaken up. So th- the last thing I'm going to say about this uh, this gig and my feelings going into it is that my sh- my confidence is just like this roller coaster because th- I'm coming off of this Okomediaki show which went fairly well for what I expected and then I kind of selected out the jokes that I wanted to use and I've been testing them on all like Japanese people that I know and and like people who work in, in the TV shows that I work for and they are going over really really well but then one of the tv shows that i work for recently they've switched casters and i do my normal jokes and humor that i do on the show every week Your and normal shtick. my normal shtick i do a bokeh at the top where where the show they announce the lineup for the show like we do at the type of this one except we take ours very seriously um they announce the contents for the day and Whenever my corner is announced, my segment, as it were, I try to throw in some kind of bokeh, which is I say something silly or I do something unexpected that the that is then the Japanese people's opportunity to be like, that was a weird thing that you said and to jump on it. But um, so this week it was mini tomatoes. The recipe was about mini tomatoes. And I present myself as a ryori kenkyuka, which is a food researcher, somebody who studies and develops recipes. And so I said... Mini tomato wo kenkyu shite kekka. The results that I figured out from doing my research on mini tomatoes is if you take a mini tomato and freeze it and then throw it at someone, that's not cool. <laughs> Which is a really standard base level Japanese style bokeh. And all it requires is for somebody in the studio to go. Someone in the studio the to students. go. The students. The studio audience. And that's not even correct. I meant the studio. For someone in the studio to go, what? <laughs> like that's all it requires. Yeah, yeah we, we were expecting some, we were expecting something more sophisticated than that. And you I don't got need to research that nothing. So it's like soya soyaro. It means of right. course that's like that's right. that's natural. That's normal. Of course that's the way it is. Like it's a right. standard. So uh, they what they said was nothing. Right. So, and, so they just gave you this blank stare like... Yeah, mm, and I had to turn I to the, the newest cast member and be like, you definitely shouldn't do that, so stop doing it. And she was like, I'm not, which which <laughs> is more of a comedic reaction than anything that they did. And afterwards, I said to the guy, I was like, look, you got to give me something there, otherwise you just leave me up there to die. Like, it's you got to say something. And he was like, I know, I know, I didn't know what I should have said. And afterwards, I thought about it, and I, I should have been like, ah, taberebe yokatta no ni, ara, ya, demo, sore demo kouteru kai. Which translates as like, <laughs> oh, you should have just eaten it. Oh, wait, it would still be frozen. Oh, no. And it's like, no, you should not have said that. <laughs> That's not <laughs> you, funny either. You definitely shouldn't. Like you're, I think you're overthinking it a little much, man. But they're just so, like, they're not and, equipped to deal so think, with humor. Do so you think the audience, like, I'm just imagining the people watching this. Do you think that the people who are kind of half tuning in or don't really know you are just watching this going, who is this 
idiot. Who is yeah. this absolute clown well, that's coming on and, I, and is saying this absolute nonsense unchallenged? I think the Japanese people who watch who are used to my character know that it's a joke. I think the Japanese people who watch and have any kind of critical thinking or creative thinking abilities whatsoever realize that there should have been a Tsukomi there. Um, but yeah, if you, well, if you don't, then, then you've got it. You've just like, that's a guy who says weird things. But talking about until to... October, it was like, it was, I want to say the guy, the guy was really good at doing Tsukomi, but even then, like all the stuff I, I kind of tee up are really like softball pitches. There was one where we, we had just gone to see a place that made kimchi out of cucumbers and then the week after that we went to see the place where they grew the cucumbers and so it was two consecutive weeks of kimchi using cucumbers and then the cucumbers and so the second week i was like so last time we went to a factory that makes kimchi out of cucumbers so today maybe we'll get to see how they turn cucumber kimchi back into cucumbers <laughs> <laughs> and instantly he was like no that's not no no which is all it requires yeah. But the new people give me nothing. Oh, man. Well, on the note of people giving us nothing, I wonder what emails Brian's have sent this week. We got an email from Brian in Fukuoka, and it says, Here we go. Great job this week, as per usual. Unfortunately, I'm sad to report I'll likely not have the time to listen to the podcast anymore, as my company is switching to a 30-day work week. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> nice one, Brian. I gotta give well, it to Brian, Brian for on that making one. us laugh. Although okay. while we're here, I want to say uh, we reached a little milestone when you and I started this podcast. Um, I don't know, it seems like twenty years ago, but what was it like three, four months? Yeah, back when I used to be thin. Yeah, uh, we said our goal was to try to get a thousand downloads this year, and we have like a thousand and twenty downloads. So congratulations to us. We are the best podcasters in the world. I think it goes something like Joe Rogan, then us, then all the other podcasts. Should we call it quits? Uh, yeah, let's quit yeah, now. Yeah, let's quit, stop it. Quit while let's we're ahead. Stop it. We'll, we'll until, cut here. Until next week. Yeah. Time for the news. Bobby, and what might be our final ever treatment of the news? What is the story this week? Japan actress Erika Sawajiri admits to using MDMA and other illegal drugs. MDMA is ecstasy. She's also uh, admitted to other types of illegal narcotics, as well as marijuana and uh, cocaine. Right, let's start with defining what a drug is. Is the adrenaline of a river cruise a drug? Uh, I say it feels like it is. Um... So what's this actress? What's this actress been in? Uh, why don't we just call her an actor, by the way? Uh, yeah, it's kind of a weird headline. It's not Japanese actor or Japanese actress. It's Japan actress. Yeah, it sounds like somebody odd. who acts and portrays Japan. What's she been in? Has she been in good stuff? Uh, yeah, she's been in a handful of good stuff. I don't really enjoy Japanese movies or drama, but she's very, very famous. She's a model and actress. She's extremely beautiful. Um, and she's been in the news a lot before. So she, she's admitted taking ecstasy, LSD, cocaine, and marijuana and been using them for over 10 years. Um, she was arrested recently for drug possession. But when I first got to Japan, she was in the news because she got like blacklisted for a little while because she was at the presser for some movie. You know, they do like the red carpet premieres and they do the press junket and they do yeah. all these interviews with all the actors. And they were interviewing them and they, they were asking all these very typical presser questions. And she's standing there in this row with all of her co-stars and they go, can you tell us some kind of like anecdote or funny story or some memory that you have about something you enjoyed about this shoot? And she said, Betsuni. <laughs> Which means not, like, not, not really. particularly. And like yeah. that was, and she shut it down and she was like, like visibly being curt and like not not into the interview at all and made every all of her other co-stars really uncomfortable so she got this reputation for being kind of like a hard ass difficult and moody person but then but then she she did apologize about that after didn't she she like did yeah. Her age, yeah, yeah 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 she did and she she was blacklisted for a little while i think she made like a recovery and her her image is kind of like cool and funky and sexy and badass. 
and like somebody who just says what they think and doesn't take any shit. She also spent a bit of time in the UK. Did she? Yeah. Uh, apparently she speaks um, ba- basic English with her, I think her ex-husband or, or some guy that was like way older than her. I think there's some scandal about that. Anyway. Do you have any <laughs> look, look at- references for this or are you just making it up? No, I'm being serious. Uh, I've obviously oh. researched this and I've read her Wikipedia. Oh. I um, So well, look, what we're concluding is she's a, a, a bit of a cool cookie. We like yeah, her. Yeah, and so whenever there's any news about like some famous person, so if you if you don't know the culture around illegal drug use in Japan, um, apparently it's more common in Tokyo, especially among celebrities and this and that. But it, there's extremely strict laws against it, and whenever somebody gets caught using drugs, any kind of drugs, or anyone gets you know exposed for being addicted to drugs, any kind of illegal drugs. It's this huge thing, and it destroys their career. This is even, by the way, like marijuana, right? Like yeah, anything yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, yeah. And it's something that, that most people who've been busted with it have not been able to recover from. But the initial reactions to Erika Sawajiri using drugs from her fans have been like people like commenting on Instagram and Twitter, like she looked so cool when she was getting arrested. <laughs> and the tone yeah. of all the articles is like is like she's cooperating, she's admitting, she's working with police, she's this and that. And so there's this really there's this tone of of pre forgiveness around it. At least it seems to me. So for for having MDMA, does that mean that, that she could um like go to, to prison? Oh yeah, um, this is all convictable stuff. But I guess that's where like the the cooperation comes in. I don't know if she's like naming names or giving them her suppliers. What one thing I am consistently uh, surprised about is how little drugs there are in Japan, right? Like if you do want to get drugs, you can get them. Yeah, apparently but it's, they're there. But it's really well. hard. Yeah. It's, yeah, that's the point. It's the, it's there if you look, right? Compare that to, say, Berlin, where I recently was a few months ago, yeah. and take it to uh, a party where, like, a guy was... Like, there was a guy that was searching everyone on the way in to the, to the nightclub, mm. and I knew that my friend had drugs with her, and I said, oh, man, like... He's like he's searching people, and she was like, mm, "Yeah, for knives." <laughs> like, like, yeah, they, yeah. They, they they find drugs, and they just, and also right. This this is really funny. The club had um, it's hard to explain, but kind of there was like an upstairs area with um, a series of booths, no larger than photo booths, which had curtains. And the official reason for these booths was that's where people might want to get intimate. Uh, but the, the actual reason is that's a, a convenient, well-lit place to, to um, snort drugs. And yeah. I, I really liked how that kind of typifies Berlin at, the Berlin attitude, which is like, in Japan, there's no way you could admit, oh, yeah, that's where everyone goes to fuck, um, which is not, the, not even the actual reason why these things were built. Like, going to fuck is their cover story. Whereas yeah. in Japan, right, I, I, I genuinely don't think I've ever seen people taking drugs in front of me. I don't think I've ever... Thought, like I think on just one occasion in Rapongi, I was approached by someone asking if I was looking for something. Yeah. Um, but that's probably only because it was that part of Rapongi, which is a very nightclub-y district, and yeah. I was a white guy walking by myself. I've it's come astonishing across how drugs, drugs are offers for drugs in like three situations in the 14 years that I've been here. And I was never into drugs in the States. Like I, I smoked weed a handful of times. And Bobby! Right, now we're going to have to put a, a, an apology on our website, aren't we? Right, you need to word that before this episode goes out. Please word the apology. We'll put it in the episode notes. Okay. It'll be real short. Uh, <laughs> but no, but like I was never never really into drugs. And then, so I haven't had any trouble avoiding them here. But but that's also because like you come across them so rarely. But in those three times when I did come across them, my immediate reaction was like, I need to separate myself from this as much as possible as soon as possible because it's yeah deportable stuff it's like ruin your life kind of stuff yeah for sure that said, my, it, <laughs> that said that they said are delicious in this case this with this sawajiri sound like she it seems to me very much like there's this atmosphere of ready to forgive her already for it and the people right. who talk about it on 
again, like, it's hilarious to hear people talk about, like, ecstasy or marijuana. Like, it's a, such a serious, hardcore thing. But the people on TV, yeah. and they really are, like, it's all over the news constantly, and it's it's so zannen, it's such a shame, she's wasted her life, she's this and that. But it's like, you kind of also get the sense that she's going to be okay. She, like she's very attractive she's very cool she's very <laughs> sexy and every time i turn on the tv i just see like they've got so much stock footage of her and she looks fantastic in all of it so it's stock footage of this gorgeous model and then on the bottom it says cocaine lsd mdma and it just looks like a really really effective commercial for drugs <laughs> 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 well, that's, well it, like, and also, th there's two parts to this. Firstly, it's like uh, g generally the discourse about drugs in Japan is awful. That that different levels of drugs are all put in the same bucket, right? Which is yeah. know, cannabis is, is treated as seriously as, as as much much harder stuff. Um, in some instances, even by the law, but generally in discourse, there isn't much to differentiate between the discussions. And secondly, I bet all these people that are all these newscasters, I I bet given half a chance, they've dabbled. Right, like I just, I just, I just don't believe uh, that uh, every single newscaster, which is uh, saying what an absolute piece of work she is, uh, believes believes what they're saying. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, in the entertainment industry, it's much more it's it's much more uh, common and much more accessible, especially in Tokyo. And like I, I've had people tell me that you know all the celebrities do it, all the models do it. Uh, my experience is a little bit different, A, because I'm local, and B, like I said before, because I always have this sense that even stuff like, you know, drinking and driving or, or you know, jaywalking and stuff like that, it's like as a foreigner, you stand out so much more that something that's moderately wrong will, will be taken as severely wrong, and then something that's illegal is like you get deported and you're not allowed to come back. And C, because you're not a celebrity. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, real quick, totally unrelated to the drug thing, but about this whole Erika Sawajiri. One of my favorite... Are you familiar with the Sumimas Gainins from Yoshimoto? The We Live entertainers? The We Live comedians? So... No. There's, what, 47... 47 prefectures, Todofuken throughout Japan and Yoshimoto is the company the most famous company that produces and manages comedians so the sumimas gainin is uh, comedians who live in one of those todofuken one of those 47 places so like metal luck in saga are the saga sumimas gainin right okay so they're kind of representing that prefecture <clears throat> yeah so they went right. through and uh, a few years back they said a lot of gainin comedians do it under their real names uh, yep. or under normal name sounding names. And they were like, no, we need to change it to something catchy. So they took like Nonaka Yusuke is one of the guys in Metal Luck and they changed his name to Nopo Nonaka or uh, Bishiki Takashi. Like they changed all the names to make them like catchy band sounding or brand sounding. And um, one of the names that I heard of Asumi Masugeni, and that's the absolute favorite comedian name I've ever heard is Sawajiri Edia. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, it's a play on her name, but also it sounds like the, the butt touching area, which is just really, really funny to me. Oh,